Hello and welcome to the Creative Lotus Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Zaki. Not that I'm the only one, but I've become someone that challenges myself to create a sense of community in the dance world. And, you know, people come and take my class and I encourage people to, hey, let's all go out for coffee afterwards and or, or for a bite to, for lunch or whatever. And, you know, we end up hanging out for an hour, to two hours, three hours sometimes, just like talking and dialoguing and having heart to heart conversations lead to us feeling more connected. And because we feel more connected, when we show up the next time, we don't feel so scared or timid. We actually feel a little bit more confident because we recognize each other's humanity a little bit differently now. And and then the way we perform because of that is different because we feel confident. So the, the teachers watching now see the confidence in that and the quality of your movement changes. Creating a sense of community, sure, it's people connecting, but changes everything I've realized. And it's become one of my favorite things to do now is like every time I teach. Hello and welcome to the Creative Lotus Podcast. On this week's episode, we have choreographer, dancer, and movement director, J.M. Rodriguez. Please enjoy this episode. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Yes. So, J.M., I ask every guest just to get us started, uh, you know, kind of if you can give us some background. So maybe like where you're born and raised, um, and then ultimately kind of what brought you here to L.A. if you weren't born here uh, to start with. <laughs> yeah. So I am actually born and raised in Los Angeles. I grew nice. up in a few different parts of uh, LA kind of moving around here and there, East LA, Boyle Heights, City of Commerce. And then, yeah, at the, around the age of uh, 10, in between 10 and 11, moved into a neighborhood called Highland Park, which uh, is interesting because when I first moved uh, to this neighborhood, it was not uh, the most ideal uh, place to live in. Um, pretty dodgy, pretty scary, actually. And mm. um, now it's just like the Mecca for artists and creatives so it's just really interesting and i I still live in the area um not at home but uh i do live in the area and uh it's just yeah it's nice to see how things have shifted i yeah i am working as a uh, professional dancer uh choreographer movement director it's led to some acting opportunities which hopefully i can continue pursuing that as well along the way you know i i never thought that I would work as a professional dancer or Hmm. in the arts and entertainment. I uh, kind of uh, was, I just had my ideas when I was younger. And so I I did want to, when I graduated high school, I did want to leave as far away as possible from LA. Um, And I did, I went to college in in Pennsylvania and uh, was studying to become an archaeologist, geologist, uh, ultimately become a paleontologist. (laughs) But uh, yeah, I ended up uh, stopped. I I stopped going to school after my, during my sophomore year, I just, uh, I I, I did drop out and I moved back home to LA and, uh, Dance was the only thing that could uh, get me work. You know, I uh, was taking a teacher's class. One of my teachers from high school, she would teach at a dance studio in LA, a really popular one. And she taught like six days a week. So she would let me assist her. And that meant a free class for me and give me something to do while I, you know, had all this free time. And so, um, yeah, I remember searching left and right for jobs, right and left and, uh, McDonald's, Taco Bell, uh, Ralph's, like I would not get any kind of responses from anyone. And then, uh, after like a month and a half of doing that, I was talking to the, my dance teacher and she was like, why don't we just try getting you signed? And I was like, huh? She's like, yeah, as a professional dancer, before you knew it, within a month I was booked on, uh, show on a Disney channel. Yeah. Disney channel show. I then like booked this touring job that took me out of, uh, Cal or out of LA for like six months, you know? So it was just like, Whoa, I did not realize I could do this, but here we go. Here we are. And, uh, I did originally plan to go back to school, but because of how things are moving in my, with my career, uh, I decided to stay. So I am here to stay <laughs> nice. and I haven't left. Well, I have left. I've, I've definitely had traveled a, b- a bunch during my 13 years of working professionally as a performer, but LA is definitely my home and it's where I've been able to really establish my roots. So yeah. Amazing. Wait, so I guess kind of backing up a little bit, like where did you start doing dance? Because you're, you know, you said, like you said, your career going off to school was completely different than that. So kind of how did you, were you doing dance in like middle school, high school and took, you were just like, screw it, let's go this other direction. 
Yeah. So, uh, my mom, she's, she's an artist herself, a visual artist. And, um, she raised me, my brother, my little sister, uh, in the arts. Uh, so okay. all the art forms were always a part of our life. Um, mm -hmm. dance, I, I, my little sister's family, uh, had a bunch of dancers, like they, they were doing like ballet and hip hop and all these things. And they joined these like competitive dance groups and stuff. And so there was a moment where I wanted to uh, join this little hip hop group and, um, her, my sister's cousins would teach the choreography and then we'd perform it at places and we'd, uh, we'd yeah, compete. And, uh, it was fun. And I ended up, uh, auditioning for a performing arts high school called the LA County high school for the arts. And, okay. um, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Uh, all I, all I knew was hip hop and I, mm -hmm. I show up at this audition and they're like, all right, get into your ballet tights and you know, your white fitted shirt. And I was like, huh? ballet tights i'm supposed to be doing ballet right now what the heck so yeah. the audition was my very first ballet class and modern class and all of the above but yeah that school was incredible it was i i really got to learn um my i learned dance like in all all forms uh mm -hmm. from ballet modern jazz and and really 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 good training and i you know i did start late i though i did have my first ballet modern and jazz classes there in high school. However, because of maybe my age or my, the way my brain has had developed at that point, I kind of took it seriously because I felt like I was not only behind compared to all the other dancers, um, in, in my grade. Um, but also I felt like I needed to catch up in order to mm -hmm. maintain good grades and, and just to make some, make the most out of it. So I worked extra hard, not necessarily any harder than any other students, but for myself, I worked extra hard and, right. uh, really tried to catch up to my, my fellow, uh, dancer, uh, classmates. Yeah. By the time I was a senior, I definitely grew a lot. However, because the school was geared towards this very um, technical based, uh, classically trained, gearing you for the gearing you up for the uh, company world, conservatories, you know, right. universities and things like that. Um, I felt like based off of the amount of training I had and based off of what I felt like I couldn't do, uh, I, there was no way that I'd ever uh, be able to work professionally as a dancer because it's just, mm. you know, I started way too late compared to all the other people I was dancing next to. And yeah, I just, I, I did doubt myself a lot. I was like, oh, I don't have the same lines and technique. And I didn't know how to move. I will say I, I, I've always been a mover. Um, yeah. But, you know, as a professional, you, you have to be able to back it up, back up the movement with uh, technique usually. Mm -hmm. And so um, I did have technique as well. I, I took four years of intense like training. However, I just felt like I wasn't... Uh, capable maybe of, mm -hmm. of achieving, you know, a professional career in dance. So that's right. why I, uh, ended up going to school for academics. However, be again, because of the training I got, it was really good training. And when I had the opportunity to actually step into that world and see if, if it's even worth a shot, I did realize, um, right away that it actually was possible. Um, mm. and, and also the fact that I was working commercially here in LA, because there is a couple different sides to the dance world. There's like the, com the company world, which, mm -hmm. you know, dance companies like Alvin Ailey and complexions and lines and all these, uh, big companies or conservatories, even, you know, like things that are based in like live performance art, that's one side. And then you have commercial dance, which is like what you see on TV shows, movies, commercials, all that stuff. It tends to be a little bit more showy, a little bit more, um, Zazz, I guess, but, uh, they are definitely different. However, because I had this classically trained background and I was showing up mm -hmm. to these, uh, commercial auditions, it did actually make me stand out because at least back when I was starting, now it's slightly different. These little kids these days are crazy. Uh, they can do everything. Yeah. Uh, when I was starting, uh, there was definitely a lack of classically trained, uh, dancers, you know, mm -hmm. in the commercial world. So, I did, I did notice myself, uh, standing out in that sense, um, when I would go to auditions, but, uh, yeah, I, I never thought that I would be here saying that I'm a dancer, but here I am today, you know, doing it for the past 13 years. So that's awesome. 
Yeah, it's funny. So I was, I grew up in kind of the performance world and I actually went to performing arts high school as well. Um, and I auditioned actually for tap. That was like my thing. You know, I like grew up with like Shirley Temple and everything. And so I tapped for like over eight years and I went to this high school and I was like, yeah, I'm going to be like this, you know, pro tapper or whatever. And, you know, and then I realized how clicky, you know, the school was for dance specifically. So like if you weren't on like, you know, the teachers, you know, list then like you really weren't going to advance and so i was just like yeah this isn't really for me and so then i kind of went into the visual art side of it and started doing painting and drawing and stuff but um yeah that's so amazing that you learned all this dance but then ultimately you decided you know you're like go to school for academics but then ultimately come back to it and yeah made a career out of it which is incredible yeah it's like it's like it followed me or something it's like this was this is what you were meant to do and you know i i could always go back to school however i feel like i like where i'm moving right now and i want to be able to continue moving in that direction and mm-hmm. i've also realized like because i i challenge myself to do this i'm actually inspiring a lot of people around me including my family um, my mm-hmm. friends especially my friends that um work in the industry as well where maybe their c- career currently isn't moving as fast as they'd like yeah i i really nowadays i find that i'm like no i want to prove to them even that like there's no need to give up so, um, yeah, that's been a pretty big motivator for me to continue going because it's not, it's not easy being in this career, you know, working in entertainment where everything is just so uncertain, especially after the pandemic, it's even uncertain times a thousand. So, um, yeah. it's not fun to live a life of uncertainty. You know, you never know when you're going to have another job or the next paycheck, or you might do a big job. And then last minute, you'll see that you're, you weren't even put in the final edit, you know? Right. So, right. um, it's, it's all, it's, there's so many factors. Yeah. It's, it's such a, a, a challenging career to be a part of. However, yeah, if you keep it up, I really feel like you will find your, your path within the community or within the industry. And if anything, if you keep it long, keep it up long enough and you're able to make something out of it, you can help others create their you know, create paths for others or help them out along the way, which is where I'm at right now, trying to help guide, you know, the younger generation of dancers who have been coming to take my class recently and whatnot, just really creating a sense of community, to be honest, because that makes a huge difference. Yeah. Especially in a city like LA where it's so isolated, you know, it's so spread out in LA and, and it's easy to feel very isolated. So. Yeah, definitely. I know it's funny. I think a lot of people come to LA thinking like, oh my gosh, you know, there's like all these people, it's like going to be so community based, whatever. And then you realize how like isolating it is. Yeah. Like everyone has like their clicks. They have their own thing. Like you are in one part of the city, not another. You're not going to cut across town. Like everyone thinks that everything's so close, but it's like, no, you far, far from each other. Usually if that's the case. Yeah. So yeah. I'm curious, kind of going deeper into kind of what you're talking about, which are like, what are maybe some struggles that you've had to go through kind of in your career, like for the last 13 years, but that you feel have kind of like helped you and motivated you to kind of stay in the game, you know, something that someone might seem, see as kind of a a difficult situation, but you kind of like turned it over and you feel like it made you grow even more. Well, for one, you know, I've, um, the, the, my, the first maybe five, six, seven, eight years of working professionally in the industry where a lot, it was a lot of like trying to figure out how I can connect to um, other people so that I can potentially get opportunities and, Mm -hmm. you know, get agents so that they can find me opportunities. And then maybe I can meet choreographers and they can give me, you know, all these things of like, almost like searching for the opportunity from, from something else, from somewhere else relying on on other people essentially right. to give you these things um which you know is kind of what what happens when you're especially when you're first starting your first few years obviously there's not like you can, i mean you can you can say i'm going to create my own work and bam do it but um yeah. you know when you're starting you don't know anything you don't know anyone so it's hard to to find those opportunities so um when the pandemic hit uh i couldn't rely on anyone or anything to get me work. Mm-hmm. I couldn't rely on my agents. I couldn't rely on the company. I, I used to, I've danced with the company for 11 years and yeah. I couldn't even rely on them to get me work. I 
couldn't rely on my friends who were choreographers to get me work because the whole industry was closed, you know? So there was no one literally that I could rely on. I was really, uh, struggling with the idea of calling myself a professional dancer anymore because Mm. if i'm not getting work and there's no you know there's nothing to be done then how can i call myself a professional dancer you know um and the whole point of a professional dancer i guess is uh being able to perform being able to make money being able to create a career off of it and Mm -hmm. if i'm not doing that then there's no way i can call myself this you know and um what i learned actually was or what i was determined was that instead of the pandemic determining the outcome of my career i wanted Mm -hmm. to determine the outcome of my career so um i just i just decided that i was going to take full responsibility i was gonna um be i was i was gonna create opportunities myself. I'm not going to wait for people anymore. And um, I'm not going to wait for my agents or my company or anything like that to uh, give me an opportunity to perform. Um, And so I, you know, I was just really, uh, I practiced Buddhism. I was engaging, I was engaging in my Buddhist practice of chanting. And I think that um, through my chanting and through studying uh, my, my mentor's guidance on not giving up and taking responsibility, I Mm -hmm. realized like, oh, you know what? I can actually, I can use social media. I can use social media as a tool to uh, not only connect with people, but maybe there's a way where, yeah, I will post and not make money right now off of this post, but maybe this post can be the exact post that someone will see that will keep me in their mind for maybe the next few months. And then when the opportunity comes, they're like, that person that I saw three months ago, like I want to use. So basically I started posting on social media, um, Mm. myself dancing. And it's interesting because yeah, I've been dancing for a long time, but Mm. I am not the person to uh, watch myself on video. I hate the way I look when I dance. I'm just very self-critical. And, uh, I, if you looked at my Instagram before the pandemic, you probably couldn't tell that I was a dancer because of how little I post about dance. Um, I, I would mainly post like a tree or, or a view of something because I just edited it and I liked it, you know, but um, yeah. I started to challenge this like self doubt about, you know, what, what I'm presenting when I show myself on video when I'm dancing, you know, like mm-hmm. I started to challenge it and I decided, okay, this post is going to, it's going to get me work this post is going to be the reason why I can still call myself a professional dancer. Yeah. Maybe I won't see the money right here and there, but um, once everything opens up, once it's possible to have an opportunity, it's going to be because of this post, like I was deciding. Mm. And so I constantly or consistently was posting ever since then. Like it was probably three, four months into the pandemic where I decided this. I just, uh, yeah. And actually one thing I realized too, was that, a lot of my friends that were dancers that were doing well in the industry, um, Mm -hmm. they packed up and went home and, and during the pandemic and quit their careers as a dancer. And some of them got married and had kids and bought homes and changed their careers, like literally. And I wanted to be someone that can prove to myself, but also prove to others that again, you know, there's never any need to give up on your goals and dreams. And if this is something that I want to accomplish, being a professional dancer and thrive in, within that career, I, I got to show people through my posts, you know, I want to show them that there is yeah. no need to give up, you know? And so, um, I decided that each post was going to inspire at least one person. Um, mm-hmm. so I really feel like that kind of intention along with like, uh, really deciding that this post was going to create an opportunity for me to still be a professional dancer. I don't know. I just said the momentum started to build and I became, uh, very consistent with my posting and yeah, people started to recognize what I was doing to the point that once the industry finally opened up nine months later, I was triple booked on, on commercial jobs. You know, I had a TV show. I had a, I had an animated series that, um, I was going to shoot and then uh, there was this like a pilot for a a show or something like that. And I had to turn down opportunities so that I could do, you know, at least one of them. Uh, But it was just like really crazy to see this shift because before the pandemic where I was in my career, 
I was doing well. People recognized me here and there, but uh, I was struggling a lot where I was after the pandemic or when things finally opened up after the pandemic, it was like people wanted to work with me. People were requesting me. People were direct booking me. I didn't have to audition wow. for things. And I booked like TV show left and right. And, you know, dancers that I had been wanting to maybe someday dance with in the mm -hmm. future you know, were hitting up, hitting me up to see if I was available to dance with them. And I was like, wait, you want to dance with me? Like, I, I, I thought I would be the one reaching out to you someday about it, whenever mm -hmm. I'm brave enough to, and now you're reaching out to me, you know? Wow. And so it was just, yeah, crazy to see how, when I took control of the situation, it wasn't that my, it wasn't that my problems went away necessarily, but um, I was able to change my mindset, the way I was viewing my situation. And I was mm -hmm. able to determine that I was going to be the one to, to decide the outcome. And I really feel like uh, that gave me, yeah, motivation to just go for it, you know? And, and honestly, one thing that people kept telling me during the pandemic or, or just throughout the past few years, it's like, how do you do it? How, how don't you get like burnt out? Don't mm -hmm. like, how are you so consistent? Actually, one of the things that I would, a lot of people would, would respond to the posts that I would put out a lot of what I found. It wasn't like, Oh my God, you're so good. I mean, people say that, but what I was <laughs> seeing a lot more of was, wow, you're so consistent. And I didn't realize that mm -hmm. consistency was something that a lot of people struggled with, but that was one thing that a lot of people were noticing is how consistent I was. And I think that might, that might be one of the prime reasons why people started to reach out to me because maybe they could trust that, uh, I would mm -hmm. be if based off of like my consistency, maybe that, you know, they could trust that I'd be someone, uh, worth working with, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just crazy to see how so much has shifted from thence till now, you know, and, uh, now I'm, I'm working as a choreographer, which is kind of new for me. Um, I've choreographed before, but mm -hmm. now it's like officially a thing this since last year, I've been, uh, teaching regularly for the first time and, um, setting work on different, uh, companies and universities and things like that and uh being invited to teach master classes and it's just mm -hmm. yeah it's wild to see how much momentum i've built especially during a time when when there was very little momentum to be built you know or where it yeah. seemed as if there was no momentum to be built you know i was able yeah. to like full speed you know it was crazy so hmm. yeah i don't know if that fully answers i don't know if that even answers your question or not but uh <laughs> Yeah, that no, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You actually kind of answered one of my questions I was going to ask down the line, which was about tw uh, COVID-19 and everything. And no, I mean, I think that's incredible. I think, like you said, right, it's about not giving up and creating moments for yourself to be able to flourish when it's seemingly like impossible. And yeah, the fact that you said, like you said, your consistency is actually what shows that like you are not going to give up when a lot of people did literally gave up, you know, and said like, I can't do this anymore, you know, pack up and kind of leave. So yeah, that's a super inspiring. You know, you obviously talked about Buddhism and that's actually how I met you and know you is through our community, you know, with the SGI. And so this podcast was born out of the pandemic, but ultimately this idea of, you know, the lotus flower representing cause and effect. And so I'd like to ask each kind of guest that I interview, you know, what do you think your uh, creative lotus moment of your life has been of this kind of like seeding of kind of the, the struggle underneath the water, but this, you know, kind of rise of this gorgeous kind of lotus flower on the top of the water. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I love the, the analogy of the lotus flower because the only way that it it looks the way that it does is if it's growing in the you know murkiest darkest muddiest of waters um and i feel like i i you know i grew up poor with a single mom with three kids i yeah the opportunities that i had um i never honestly never really knew that i was missing out on things until i got older um mm -hmm. but uh to see how things could have gone and to really be able to use all of the kind of turmoil or just my my history to use my history as a means of pushing me forward more, you know, even like just with the dance world, like this, the uncertainty, um, it can it can feel pretty ugly. Uh, it can feel very um, discouraging. It can and also the industry itself 
is is very uh you know it it can be toxic it can be uh <laughs> just energy clashing left and right i'm sure like we all know um and most environments have that as well but it's you know when you're in the industry and you're dealing with other artists artists are sensitive and artists want to share their opinions and their voices so it, there's just a lot of potential for chaos in i feel like all the all the stages of my life that I've experienced. I don't know that I have one specific moment where I realized this like blossoming out of, out of the mud. I feel like I'm continually uh, almost engaging with the mud. Um, mm. And now I'm, I'm at the point in my life and in my Buddhist practice where I'm able to see the mud and almost have a little fun in it, you know, have a little mm. mud fight. Um, it's, <laughs> It's interesting because I I really <laughs> I really see uh, like now because of my the lifestyle that I live in the world that I live in it's you know uh, uh, I really find that if I'm encountering a challenge or an obstacle mm -hmm. I know that I'm doing something right I know that I'm doing something right because if I if my life wasn't moving forward then I would not be hitting resistance. And, you know, resistance only comes when you're actually moving forward. And right. I really feel like if my, if I challenge myself to keep my life moving forward and honestly, sometimes that means just saying, or, or just not giving up today, you know, could be me moving my life forward, but knowing that, or, or being aware that when we move forward, resistance appears to me, I, I, it honestly makes me feel like I'm doing something right. And I've had several situations happen within the past year, even where mm -hmm. like, all poop hits the fan and like I could easily like be depressed and want to just like quit everything. Um, mm. But instead I I'm at the point of my practice where I'm like, no, like I want to prove the power of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. I want to prove the power mm. of my life and I want to show, I have to, I have to show the people that I'm supporting, the people who look up to me, you know um, I have to show them. I have to show them. I'm going to show them, you know? So really it's been an opportunity for me to, to regain my power in a way mm -hmm. um, to sh demonstrate the power of my life and also demonstrate the power of my mentors, you know, legacy and philosophy of, yeah. of human revolution. And so, yeah, I, I feel, I, I love, again, I love the, the analogy of the Lotus flower because I can relate to it so much. Beautiful. Very well said. Thank you for sharing your story as well. I, I want to know kind of how did you get introduced to this practice? Because, uh, you know, it seems as you've shared, you know, it's very much a part of your life. Um, and it's even a part of your, your at handle on Instagram as well with the NMRK standing for not. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm, That's I would love right. to know a little bit more about, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. It's, it's awesome that, you know, because a lot of people, uh, they'll look at my Instagram handle and they're like, What's JM Manurkanurk? They're like Manurkanurk. <laughs> that that. But uh <laughs> That's hysterical. <laughs> yeah. That's so good. Um yeah, I actually uh in you know, in the Lotus Sutra we hear about Bodhisattvas of the Earth emerge dancing. Well, um mm -hmm. yeah, I was in a dance rehearsal and um there, I was. I used to dance for a Bollywood company um, for about mm. five years, and uh, it, it was within this company that um, I met a member, a Buddhist member, an SGI member. He uh, he was at that point he was directing a lot of music videos for different okay. um, Indian artists, and uh, he would use the dancers in the company I danced with uh, for mm. the music videos. And there was a point where he wanted to get back into dancing himself. And so my director Im invited him to one of our rehearsals. And um, when he got there, she actually pulled me aside. I used to help her run a lot of the, a lot of the company. Um, mm. She pulled me aside and she was like, Hey, can you meet, can you meet with this guy one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, when he gets here and just do like a private for the next two hours. And so I was like, sure, easy. So, um, you know, we, he got there, we met, uh, we were dancing and talking and whatnot. And by the end of the one-on-one -on -one session, he, um, he literally just asked me, uh, if I wanted to come with him tomorrow, he was like, or Sunday, you want to come with me Sunday morning to, uh, to meditate. That's it. Hmm. And so it was interesting because I, I was not really, 
looking for meditation per se. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I just, for some reason, didn't fully vibe with meditation. I, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of closing my mind off and like, uh, trying to quiet you know, my surroundings and quiet my mind because I've always felt like it's part of who I am and, um, I should be able to use it rather than put it away. Um, and, but, uh, literally at that time, um, I had finished reading this book about, um, it was an astrol astrologer who was Mm. astrologist who was, um, she wrote a book and in it, she was talking about a lot of different things that, um, where the, it was the first time that I was seeing or hearing or reading something from someone that had ideas or philosophies that, that really kind of naturally were what I believed in as well. So I was like, huh, this person's saying these things. And I'm like, that is what I feel like I've always believed in, even though I didn't grow up any, with anyone telling me this. Um, mm. and yeah, one of the things I was searching for was spirituality because of it. And so I was like, could I call, I, I couldn't, I never vibed with my own uh, religion growing up. Um, I grew up mm-hmm. Catholic on my mom's side, Christian on my dad's side. And mm-hmm. I just, at an early age, I was like, no, I can't, I can't say thank you to something outside myself because of all mm-hmm. the crazy stuff that I've been through and what I've been able to accomplish. I did the yeah. work. So I cannot say thank you something else for giving me this thing because I did the work. Um, wow. And, you know, I, there are many other religions that I would like be kind of like, looking at but um i just yeah this concept of giving something to outside yourself i just it wasn't i couldn't vibe with it and so um and there were other different forms of like spirituality and self-help and and my mom would like always try to tell me about the secret the secret she's like yeah you'll like it and i was was like no i won't i don't know why but i just i don't want it you know and uh but I started after reading this book, I started to really question my spirituality because if I don't practice any form of spirituality, um, Mm -hmm. what, like what kind of, can I call myself spiritual? Um, Mm -hmm. the one thing that I did believe in was myself and I believed in other people. Um, but I, and I, I've felt that way for many years, but I never knew if I could consider myself spiritual if I believe in myself and believe in others. Like, could I, does that mean I'm a spiritual person? I don't know. So it was funny that this member, literally during this time of like contemplating these things, he was like, do you want to come meditate? And even though meditate was not a word that typically would be like, yes, um, I was like, you know what, because I'm searching for it, I'll take it. Let's go. I'll do it. Um, wow. And it just so happens, actually, he doesn't remember the story fully, but I'm pretty sure this is how it went. Uh, I show up Sunday, I show up Sunday morning and I rode my bike, uh, to the train station. I took the train to the, to the center, North Hollywood Mm -hmm. and the Buddhist center. And, um, I got there, I called, I called, I called, he didn't respond. He didn't answer. It's like Hmm. nine in the morning. I was like, well, he must've slept in or something. You know, he's a young man. I'm sure he yeah. might've gone out the night before is what I was thinking. So right. he maybe just overslept. Um, and naturally I would have turned around and just went back, but because I rode my bike, I took the train, I got right. there, I walked to the center. I was like, you know what? I made it this far. I might as well just go in. Um, and that's mm-hmm. when I found out that it was a Buddhist center. Um, I saw all the lights on. And when I walked into the main room, uh, you know, people turned their heads and, like were smiling really big and like telling me, Oh, come here, come on. You know? And it was interesting because no, no relation to this whatsoever. It's kind of very mystical, but, uh, the (laughs) week before the weekend, before I went to this Buddhist meeting, it was like a couple days before I met this, this person who introduced me, I was hanging out with a friend. We were flipping through the channels at my, at my apartment and the travel channel came on and there was this like, the, this Buddhist temple in Hacienda Heights or something like that. That's like a big tourist attraction with beautiful views and things. And we were like, Hey, we have nothing else to do today. Let's go see this Buddhist temple. So it's funny oh, wow. because I went to this Buddhist temple and it was beautiful, but architecturally speaking, it was beautiful. But, uh, it, I got scolded because I was wearing shorts and a tank top and a, and a hat when I walked into this room and I didn't know the the doors were open. Um, there yeah. was like little, uh, machines to like 
put a coin in to get like a little fortune or something. So I was like, oh, this looks like it's open to the public if this is all right here. So let me walk in. And because of that, and it was kind of like dark and moody in there because of that, Mm. they like shooed me out and it was a little off putting. And also I felt I got discouraged myself because uh, I was walking through this courtyard full of like all these Buddhist statues and Mm. I felt like something was wrong with me because I wasn't feeling any type of like spiritual connection to anything. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Why don't I feel anything from anyone? Like what's, what's wrong with me? You know? Um, And it's just so funny that literally a week later I go to a Buddhist center and all the lights are on. There's nothing that looks like Buddhist temple, um, mm-hmm. people actually, there was like all different types of people inside and mm-hmm. they turn around and look and smile and welcome me in rather than shoot me out. Also, I was wearing a tank top and shorts and a hat when I came to the Buddhist center, you know, so literally yeah. pretty much the same wardrobe, yeah, yeah. but different, you know? Yeah. And back then this was about eight and a half years ago. They were the, the way the meetings were kind of run was about 45 minutes of chanting. And then you have mm-hmm. 45 minutes of like dialogue, Q and a, experience and things like that. And, uh, mm. I sat there and chanted for 45 minutes and wow. I didn't know what I was saying, what I was, you know, <laughs> how to say it. But, uh, I just remember wow. going, uh, I, I rode my bike afterwards to the children's hospital in Hollywood because my little mm. brother at the time was sick with cancer mm. and I would, I would take, I would not take care of him, but, um, I lived in Hollywood. He was staying in the children's hospital in Hollywood. So And my my dad's side of the family, they would drop him off when he had chemo and they'd leave. So he'd be there by himself Mm. for like seven days straight. So I decided, being his older brother that lives literally a mile and a half away, that I would just take my butt over there to him and hang out with him while he's in the hospital. So I would stay like seven Mm. days at a time at the hospital with him. So that that day I left and I came to the hospital and I stayed the night there and I parked my bike outside and everything. And I woke up Mm. the next morning to my bike being stolen. And uh, it was crazy because... It it was about, it was about like the 10th bike that had been stolen for me in like a two year time span. So it was, I was used to it. Um, and naturally when I get my bike stolen, I feel very like lost and I feel like a, a little hopeless. Um, and, a, and very, I don't know. I, I definitely like, I, I say things that I shouldn't. It was weird though, because when this, this time when I, when the bike, when I realized the bike was stolen, mm-hmm. the first and only thought that came to my head was, oh, good, good thing there's a, a train station literally across the street from where I'm at right now. I could take the train a couple stops and then walk a mile to my apartment. So of all times and places, this is the best place to like have my bike stolen it's because it's so convenient. Um, and I even took a picture of, of the empty bike rack. It's the morning time, <laughs> sun's behind me, and I took a picture of the bike rack in front of me, and my shadow ends up appearing in the picture. And I sent it to my friends, showing them that, look, another bike stolen. Um, and my friends didn't even say anything about the bike. They just said, oh, wow, your shadow looks so peaceful. <laughs> and it was weird because I was like, wow. my shadow looks peaceful. How, like, what does that even mean? How is that even possible? Yeah. It wasn't until a couple of days later that I realized like, whoa, wait a second. I wonder if my, if the 45 minutes of chanting the day before mm. had anything to do with the way that I re- reacted to, to the bike being stolen and maybe even like, like my friend saw something in my shadow because of it. Like, this is all kind of trippy. Like what the heck, how is this even possible? And what's crazy too, is at this point I didn't have much money, but I, uh, had like a hundred extra dollars in my account that I could spend on whatever I wanted to, if I wanted Mm -hmm. to. And, um, a friend that same day that I found out my bike was stolen, a friend a few hours later hit me up and was like, Hey, how you doing? And I was just like, well, another bike got stolen, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, he was like, Oh, um, I can hit up my cousin who works at big five. He might be able to get you a discount on a new bike. And I was like, really? Okay. Hit him up. And within like five minutes, he hit up his cousin and his cousin was like, yep, we got a bike for him. hundred bucks is all we need. We'll ship it to him, uh, built and everything. And literally within 24 hours, I had a brand new bike built, shipped and everything with the hundred bucks that, you know, I could spend. So literally within 24 hours, I had a brand new bike that was actually even better than than the bike that I had gotten stolen, you know? So it was like, holy crap. Like, I guess it's almost like the, 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 like the problem never happened in a way, you know, it's like the bike is here and I can get around town again, you know? So yeah, it was a really incredible experience. I couldn't say no to coming to another meeting. And within my, within like the third a meeting that I went to, someone asked me like, Hey, do you want to just receive Gohansen? And I was like, mm. huh? 
you know, go on, you need to go on to, to become a member. And so I was like, yeah. I, can I do that? And they're like, yeah. I was like, okay, let's do it. You know? And wow. yeah, it's been eight and a half years ever since. So nice. Wow. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your story. That's so incredible. It, in the practice, you know, you talk about being kind of in sync with the universe, right? Or like mystically, everything happens, you know, for a reason. So yeah, your story exactly aligns with just that, you know, it's kind of like all these things happened to your life in rhythm with like the universe, you know, it's, and there's no coincidence. It's not like, oh yeah, magic, you know, you like juju or anything like that. It's just like, yeah. And, and your life your life condition changed, right? Like you said, to see your bike being stolen and not getting like pissed off or, you know, wanting to like curse the world out, right. you know, you kind of were like, wow, this is right. an, actually an opportunity. So that's awesome. Right. That's you know, and what's interesting, what's interesting too, is that I've always believed that I can manifest things. I just didn't mm -hmm. know how. And what I mm -hmm. liked about this practice is that, there is a practice or what I liked about this religion, I guess, is that there is a practice that's involved and it makes sense to me being a dancer. I understand what it, what it means to have a practice, you know, um, yeah. if, especially being a dancer, like if I want to continue being a dancer, I have to constantly train. I have to constantly put myself in the midst of, of dancing and performances and all these things. So with like my Buddhist practice, it's, it's the opportunity I get to really strengthen my spiritual muscles, you know, um, like going out to the, or going to work out at the gym. Um, you're working mm -hmm. on your physical muscles. Well, my Buddhist practice helps me work on my spiritual muscles so that when I step outside or when I'm dealing with the uncertain situation, like I do all the time in my career, um, I'm not so easily swayed. I can, you know, stay firmly rooted to the ground and not be like mm -hmm. toppled over. Yeah. I, I feel really, uh, powerful. I feel like I, I am able to accomplish things and, and I find motive. I find myself motivated to, to want to accomplish things even, you know, because sometimes when you see nothing moving in the direction you want it to, it's very easy to be like, hmm, and then not do anything about it and just like wallow in your, in your misery. But, um, I feel like my Buddhist practice gets me out of that so easily. Again, it's not that my problem goes away. My problem at first seems like this big thing and I seem like this tiny little rock compared to it. But then when I, I chant, the problem didn't go away, but my life feels so much bigger that the problem is no longer stopping me. I can either walk over it, I can kick it around, or I can pick it up and put it in my pocket and use it for something in the future, you know? Yeah, I feel like I, I regain my control or my power. And it helps me see the importance of uh, inspiring other people too. With everything that I do, whether it's opening up the door for someone, performing in front of someone, uh, someone coming to my class, or, or even going to a Buddhist meeting and like sharing encouragement to someone or, or just engaging in dialogue, like everything can have purpose and everything can be a tool to inspire others. I've, I've awesome. learned a lot through my practice. Yeah. I love that analogy of being able to like you also be able to like pick it up and use it later, right? It's like you're using that that struggle yeah. or that you know that shitty situation and turning it into something to you know kind of empower you. Yep. So, yeah, well, right. everything has value. Absolutely. What do you consider to be kind of one of your greatest achievements uh, that you personally take pride in, but maybe you're not outwardly known for? Like you know, obviously your social media is amazing with all these dance and everything that you do in choreo and the work that you do. But is there something that you personally take really deep pride in that, um, you know, has been kind of an achievement that you were working towards? That's a good question. Um, something that people don't know about me. And I think it's because, I mean, if you, if you were to have seen me before I started practicing Buddhism, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I struggled a lot with using my voice I struggled a lot with um, with being able to talk to someone of uh, maybe higher status of me or what I deem to be higher status, like a principal, a teacher, a choreographer, a director. Um, hmm. I yeah, I would I could never give a, pre a even like a presentation that I studied couldn't give hmm. it in, in front of a crowd because I would choke on my own breath. You know, it was like hmm. really kind of detrimental, but it wasn't until I started practicing and engaging with the SGI community. And they asked me to like be an MC. They asked me to uh, share my experience at a podium. Um, they asked me to engage in dialogue with people I don't know. So like, I really was able to strengthen that, that, uh, 
my ability to, to speak in front of people. And now mm-hmm. it's um, a lot of people love what I have to say. A lot of people want me to speak more and a lot of people value what I, what I say. People don't realize how much I struggled to get there. Um, so it's, yeah, maybe that's like a hidden thing. Like I, there's a reason why I was a dancer because using my voice wasn't, uh, wasn't really a thing for me. That's cool. That's, so. that's really, uh, yeah, that's awesome. Cause I think a lot of people can relate to that. You know, I think Thank that, you. Um, yeah, expressing yourself outwardly is easy to do, you know, physically and, and through movement and everything. But yeah, to use your voice is powerful, right? Words have very strong meaning and, and purpose as well. So, um, yeah, I totally get that. And yeah, and I was going to say that the community as well, like you said, gives you these opportunities, right? To really kind of break out of your shell and express yourself in a way that, you know, the yep. most shy person would probably never uh, consider, but it's like, it's that expansion of your life force, you know, expansion of your life that the community is all about. So yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome to hear. What do you consider to be your greatest weakness? Uh, and then what steps do you take when those things kind of come up, uh, to overcome them in the moment? I think one of my weaknesses is a tendency to be lazy. Um, <laughs> I'm naturally... Relatable. A lazy person. Yeah. Um, I'm actually a lazy person. And sometimes I, uh, I wait to the last minute to do things. You can call that procrastination, but it, it stems from laziness. Really. It doesn't, it's not like anxiety or stress or anything. It's literally like laziness. I'll just wait to the, to later to do it. Um, laziness and sometimes even foolishness. It could, it, they kind of go hand in hand in a way, you know, um, uh, almost like not caring enough to, to, or not being serious enough to like take action right away. Um, Mm -hmm. but I think because of that, I really challenge myself to take, take action daily. Um, not only so that I could combat my laziness, but even just for my sanity, like knowing that I'm moving forward, uh, even just baby steps, uh, helps me feel more confident in my career. You know, if I'm just doing one yeah. thing, you know, today, that's going to solidify um, myself in, in, in the industry, then I know that I'm doing something right. You know, but yeah, because of my laziness and uh, because I chant about it, I, I feel like I am always everywhere doing a lot of things and people are like, man, I feel like you're never home. I feel like you're never like, uh, mm-hmm. Uh, resting or you never have time off. And I do, I have plenty of time off, but um, maybe it's unconventional compared to some of the other people because of my career. I, there are moments throughout my day where I don't have anything to do because I don't have a normal nine to five, you know? So a lot of people don't see that time off. I, again, I do, I do push myself to like, go, 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 go. Otherwise I will again, wallow in my laziness so easily. Um, Yeah. But I think that's definitely one of my weaknesses. I also have a fear of uh, money. You know, I grew up poor, so uh, I, I fear that I don't, I'm never going to make enough money. Or if I do have money, I'm, I'm afraid to spend it because I feel like I'm never going to make it back. You know, so uh, I, I really I, that's something that I've been able to challenge a lot over the past few years. And um, mm-hmm. it's definitely a daily continual battle. But um, I'm at a point in my life now where um, I, I, I want to be able to prove to myself and to others my worth. And mm-hmm. um, I believe that if I can believe <laughs> that I'm worthy of, you know, living in my own place and being able to afford my bills and being able to put food on the table and being able to, um, do the things that I need to do so that I can fully and freely, um, support everyone around me and, and give the best type of classes to people so that they can be inspired. And, um, yeah, so that I can do the things that I love because the things that I love are going to inspire other people. Like, uh, I, I feel like I'm challenging these, these ideas way more than ever before. And it's, allowing me to, to open up new doors and new pathways. And I'm seeing that, um, I am creating the fortune to have all the finances that I need right when I need them, even when it doesn't look favorable. But, um, yeah, it's, it's something that I am still currently struggling with, but, uh, definitely not being held back by it. I'm not responding to fear and responding out of fear anymore. So, uh, 
it's a continual process. I'll let you know how it is in a, in a year from now. (laughs) Yeah. No, thank you. I mean, that's so relatable. I mean, you know, as I think artists and freelancers in general, right? It's like you, like you said earlier, it's like you don't know where your paycheck's going to come from. You don't know, you know, what is guaranteed. And yeah, your background and your story of who you are, it also kind of resonates this idea that like, am I perpetually going to continue to do the same thing? You know, like my family did or whatever, or am I going to like break free of that? And when you kind of don't see those results in the time frame that you want them to, or, you know, whatever, then yeah, it's easy to get kind of caught up in that same story. I feel exactly the same way. I've always struggled with this idea of having money and then like not having it, but you know, that's the beauty of this community and, and practice is that you get to kind of challenge that constantly, you know, with your prayer and taking action, you know, and yeah, I've, I've recently started yeah. chanting to just like not fear the idea of like where the money's going to come from, but know that like my life is going to be protected. I'm going to be in the right place. and I'm going to take the right action to be able to accomplish those things, you know, and money, exactly. unfortunately in this country is so prevalent, right? Like you, you need it to survive and especially yeah. in LA, it's yeah. a very expensive city too. So yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So to expand on that, yeah. um, do you have you had a moment where you felt like you quote unquote made it or something like a a real highlight of your career thus far? There was a really awesome moment um, that I had. I mean, I've I've worked for since I started working professionally in 2011, and mm-hmm. I've had many amazing um, moments uh, that I never imagined that I would experience, but. Um, there was a really cool opportunity that happened that kind of, uh, it was when I started practicing, there was a moment in my career where, uh, I didn't have any work, um, lined up. And normally I do try to set work or, or find opportunities, um, ahead of time so that I know that I can afford rent and all the, all the things, you know, and there was a moment, of course, it ended up being February, the shortest month of them all, um, where I didn't have anything lined up. And, um, I was like, all right, you know what, here we go. I've, I've been practicing for two years at this point. And I was like, here we go. Here's a new opportunity to really test the power of this practice to really test Mm -hmm. the power of my life. And, um, I just started chanting ferociously with like zero doubt possible, Mm. um, that I would, find an opportunity to perform, to Mm -hmm. inspire people, um, that I was going to find an opportunity to, uh, to inspire my fellow dancers that were going to be performing that they too would want to perform to inspire other people. Because Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know that, uh, a lot of dancers or artists think about, I mean, some, I'm sure some do, but, um, you know, I mean, for myself, before I started practicing, I wasn't thinking about, I want to inspire at least one person in the audience today with, with my performance. Like, no, it was like stress about how well I was going to do or how well I wasn't going to do. And if I'm going to get the choreography, if I'm going to do the thing right or whatever, you know, am I going to look good on stage? That whole thing. Like, that's all that I thought about. Never did yeah. I think about like the audience and, and, and them feeling like inspired by what I'm about to sh- present, you know? And, um, so I started to chant that, this, this job that I would get, if I can get a job, uh, that it was going to be something that was going to inspire even all the people that I was dancing with, that they too want to inspire the audience. Um, and I also was chanting that I need a job that month, uh, in order to be able to pay my bills. So I was like, this needs to be this amount of money or more. Uh, it's going to propel my career forward. Um, and at this point too, actually I was, uh, agent lists. I didn't have agents mm. during this time period. There's like two years in my, in my whole, uh, 13 years of commercial yeah. dance where, um, I did not have, I did not have, uh, agents and, um, I kind of wanted to get back into the agency world only because they were connected to bigger commercial jobs, especially commercials, yeah. which is what I had wanted to do. And, um, I, uh, the, I was very skeptical based off of my last relationship with the agents that I had that, you know, I didn't really want them. And if I was going to get them, it would be under certain circumstances. Um, mm-hmm. and which is basically like they come to me. And, uh, so, you know, chanting for all these things, uh, I didn't want to have to, uh, 
ask my friends or any choreographers to refer me. I didn't want to go to any casting calls um, mm. or cow calls to, to, for the agencies. Um, I, I, if they were going to come to me or if they were, if I was going to get signed, it was because they were going to come to me, you know? And mm. so I was chanting these things and I was even chanting in a way where I was like, you know what? I'm picking up the opportunity. Like I was physically doing this without, while I'm chanting, I'm like, imagining that I have an opportunity right here and I'm grabbing it and I'm putting it on my lap. I'm like, that's how much I'm believing you right now. Like there is no doubt at all creeping wow. in. And it's crazy because within uh, a couple days of chanting that way, I was in a rehearsal and um, the choreographer at the end of rehearsal, it's like a Friday, the choreographer is saying, all right, guys, I uh, just want to give you an update for next week. Uh, instead of meeting Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we're going to cancel. We're not going to have rehearsal next week at all. We'll come back the following week. Cool, mm -hmm. whatever, bam, I leave. Uh, within five minutes of me leaving this rehearsal, I get a phone call from a friend that's like, hey, are you free for this job next weekend? Um, mm -hmm. It's it's a big job, so it'll pay well, um, but the only catch is um, it's super last minute, but you have to be available every day next week and um, wow. because it's like 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. rehearsals. And I was like, wait a second, that's crazy because literally five minutes ago, I just had a choreographer say that all of our rehearsals were canceled next week. And that was the only thing that I had. So yeah, I'm free. And then he mentioned that it was for, um, Katy Perry for the Grammys. And, uh, I was like, holy crap, like what the heck? I, is it really the big, a big job like that? And he, and then he, after that, he said, uh, he was like, Hey, I, I see you don't have agents right now. Right. And I was like, yep. He's like, do you, do you want to get signed? Is that something you're interested in? Because I'll just tell my agents to hit you up after I get off the phone with you and they'll sign you for this job and possibly for future projects. And I was like, you know what, let's do it. And so, yeah, they called me within minutes after and they're like, Hey, would you like to be signed for future things? We'll definitely handle your, your paperwork for this project, but you know, maybe we could send you out on more things. And I was like, let's do it. And literally that year I booked like four different commercials and amongst other things. Yeah. It was just like, I got to perform, you know, uh, I got direct booked on this job that, you know, got me signed with agents. Um, it paid my bills for that month. And then some, you know, it was like way more than what I was asking for. And get this, not only that, I find out that what Katy Perry wanted to do this. So this was uh, 2017, February, 2017. And it was, you know, if you, if you rewind three months, it would be November, 2016. And if you understand what that is, uh, that was a crazy time when uh, people, certain people got elected. Um, and I remember the world feeling like just all types of ways. Yeah. This performance for the Grammys was actually Katy Perry making a statement to the people mm -hmm. to really recognize their rights. And the, and, and we created this image of the constitution, uh, in our, within oh, wow. our performance, uh, to, you know, to inspire the audience. And, um, I actually shakabuku at about six or seven different, or, or I shared the, my Buddhist practice and this idea yeah. of inspiring others through art. Um, I shared that with like six or seven or eight different dancers out of the 30 dancers that were a part of this thing. And, mm -hmm. um, and even at the, like literally right when we were about to uh, perform like live on the Grammys, like we're in mm -hmm. our, our set on the stage uh, and we're like all 30 dancers and Katy Perry were like sitting in this tiny little house um, and we're all holding hands and Katy Perry's like doing this prayer saying like, all right, you know, we have a mission here. We're going to inspire people, like all these things. Wow. And um like when, when, when we, when she finished her prayer, when she finished it, uh, uh, I yelled out, Nam -yo -renge -kyo, like, so that everyone could hear it. And half the people already knew about it because I've been talking about it the whole week we were there. Um, right. and then I found out that, you know, uh, within 24 hours, Katy Perry was found at the Buddhist center, um, in, in Santa Monica with, uh, yeah. one of the Buddhist leaders, Danny Nagashima. Uh, going to intermeeting. Not that I had anything to do with that, but, um, <laughs> you know, it was just like the rhythm and the timing and just like, it was just, yeah, so crazy and mystical and such an awesome opportunity. And or, or that like was the beginning of a new trajectory for my career. And it's, mm -hmm. yeah, the reason why I am where I'm at right now currently. So, um, wow. yeah, it was a huge, a huge turning point in my career. Wow. That's a, incredible. Talk about mystic too, because now Katie's with Orlando Bloom, who's also a Buddhist part of the SGI and then like she's chanting and yeah, it's, I mean, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. And 
yeah, like you said, the fact that this is kind of the change, the trajectory of your, your career is amazing. It's such, that's such a great story and uh, yeah, living proof yeah. as we say. Thanks. So I'm curious kind of what uh, brings you the most happiness now versus maybe when you first started out, uh, you know, in this uh, dancing world, if you will. What makes me happy currently in this dance world, this crazy dance world, is honestly engaging with with people. Um, I actually, uh, this past year, like I mentioned earlier, um, I've been teaching a lot, and uh, all of twenty twenty three, I like was really engaging in within my career to become a teacher and uh, and choreographer. Thanks to social media, you know, people are recognizing what I'm doing as well and, and wanting to learn from me and requesting, you know, my expertise and whatnot. Because of that, though, I am somewhat now being looked up to as maybe maybe a leader, maybe, maybe not a leader, but someone of, of influence or impact, you know? Yeah. And so... Um, I, I, thanks to my Buddhist practice and engaging, you know, with my, S, again, my SGI community, um, I realize like how powerful community is. And, um, I've, I, not that I'm the only one, but I've become someone that, um, challenges myself to create a sense of community in the dance world. And, you know, people come and take my class and I encourage people to, Hey, let's all go out for coffee afterwards. And, um, or, or for a bite tip for lunch or whatever. And, you know, we end up hanging out for an hour to two hours, three hours, sometimes just like talking and dialoguing and having like just heart to heart conversations lead to us feeling more connected. And because we feel more connected when we show up the next time, we don't feel so scared or timid. We actually feel a little bit more confident because we recognize each other's humanity a little bit differently now. And, yeah. and then the way we perform because of that is different because we feel confident. So the person, the teachers watching now, uh, see the confidence in that. And, and, you know, the quality of that cha- the quality of your movement changes. So like creating a sense of community, sure. It's people connecting, but it like changes everything I've realized and it's become one of my favorite things to do now is like every time I teach, like I want to get people together and actually because more and more of my friends are, are, are practicing now. I have, I had one of my friends receive Gohanzen. I have another friend who's on his way to receiving Gohanzen and, um, we're becoming members and, uh, Mm -hmm. because we're all hanging out in a group, you know, we're talking and a few other dancers that take my class are actually other Buddhist members as well. And so we Mm -hmm. just have these conversations that naturally stem from Buddhism or, or Buddhism comes out. And literally I, just the other day I had a friend who doesn't practice, um, or know much too much about Buddhism. She, uh, was like, Hey, uh, do you remember those those Buddhist meetings you were talking about? Can you next time we hang out? Can we talk more about that? Because I'm pretty interested. So wow. it's really crazy to see um, how people really want that sense of community. People really are hungry for um, a a healthy life philosophy um, that mm-hmm. makes sense and that is practical, but also helps us believe in the things that we think are impossible. You know. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and, and yeah, I think connecting with others, especially because, you know, LA is a very transient place. People come in and out all the time. So it's hard to really uh, create your roots here. Um, and because I'm, I'm giving people the opportunity to create that community, I, I really feel like a lot of them are, are creating those roots and I'm seeing them all work now. Like some people, uh, this group that I've been meeting up with after class, like there's, maybe four or five of them that are fresh to LA and Hmm. within the past few months, several of them are like now moving up and doing things. And absolutely not because of anything that I'm doing necessarily, but I can see how more comfortable and confident they are and who, and who they are when they show Hmm. up to my class or when they show up to rehearsals or, or to a, an audition or whatnot. Um, this sense of community really, really makes a difference. So it's definitely one thing that I, always look forward to now is engaging with, you know, my fellow dancers. It's really fun. Amazing. Um, and then on the flip side of that, what do you consider like when you first started out, you know, in this biz 13 years ago, did you feel like was your desire more maybe superficial or what brought you happiness was maybe more just kind of like the, the achievements and things, or was it kind of rooted in that same sense of community or, or purpose? Definitely, uh, when I first started, I was 
it was, again, I didn't even know that I could do this. I did not think that I, w- I was, it was possible for me to be a dancer. Um, right. the reason why I kept it up was because, because I was able to book things. So I felt like, well, commercially speaking, it's really hard to get booked on a job. And the fact that I am getting booked, maybe I should take that into consideration because, mm. um, it could be harder, uh, or not that it, it wasn't hard. It's just, um, yeah, you know, the, the, the likelihood of someone getting booked on a TV show is very, very slim. And the fact that I was able to do it was like, okay, I should really take this into consideration, you know? Um, mm. but also because I was making money that was like decent money, I, uh, realized like, shoot, I could, I could do this. If I keep this up, like I can make good money and I could do well. It was, I, I never really thought of, um, anything more than that. Um, I never, I mean, yes, the art for art's sake too. Um, but I didn't really know a, the deeper, I didn't have a deeper understanding of art necessarily. I did, but I didn't, I, I, I understood it. I understood that art, art could be deep, but I didn't know how to bring that out within my own life or with the art mm-hmm. that I was creating necessarily. Um, mm-hmm. I'm naturally a deep person and the way that I move might be pretty deep compared to or the way that people see me. Um, mm-hmm. So whether I knew it or not, people were feeling things from what I was showing, um, but I wasn't aware of it. I I wasn't at the forefront of my like intentions for why I want to dance. Um, mm-hmm. But it was definitely more about uh, just achieving the job and the money and feeling good afterwards and having fun with my friends, you know, like that's kind of like all I really cared about. Not in the same way as like creating a sense of community, but just like screwing around and and hanging out and enjoying, enjoying life, you know, Um, not, nothing really, not really taking any action with purpose though, (laughs) you know? Mm, Yeah. Um, I will say that, I mean, you kind of tapped right into the next thing I wanted to ask you about, which is like the choreography that you do and the dance that you do, the, you know, the social media videos and everything that you've created are so emotionally engaging. Like the way that you dance and perform is very like, yeah, it it kind of speaks volume. So I'm curious kind of, uh, you know, it is, dance is kind of like a form of uh, storytelling, right? And so maybe if you could just kind of expand upon like where does the emotion or kind of internal um, storytelling go on for you when you're doing choreography as well as performing um, and kind of, yeah, maybe also like how do you tap into that to share with your other performers that you're teaching how to perform the works that you create as well? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, and I appreciate everything you said. That's so kind of you. Well, if I'm being completely honest, I don't think about too much when I'm so a lot of what you see on, on social media is actually just one form of, of dance that I do. Um, people, I mean, if you were to look at my social media, you might not recognize that I can do like hip hop or that I've done Bollywood or that I, you know, just like I can do other things, but what I like to do or what comes naturally to me, um, when I like freestyle or I, when I improvise dance, um, mm-hmm. it is more, you know, of a flowy, uh, a little bit of balletic mixed with, um, a little bit of everything else. You know, I, mm-hmm. I do have uh, certain like qualities of hip hop and popping and just like different textures and musicality that I've, um, engage in. And, um, one thing that I like to think about is the unexpected. Mm. I like things that are unexpected and I try to embody that in my movement. So there are a lot of things that people recognize me for now, um, like certain spirals and just different things or a left leg going up. So there's definitely like (laughs) things that, uh, that have like, like, Oh, that's very JM, you know, like at least that's what my friends say. Um, especially people that I've been dancing with for a while now, they can almost intuitively understand where, what I'm going to do next. You know, (laughs) the, the pathways that I create and the dynamics that I create, um, I always try to think like, how can I, if this is what I'm naturally doing, how do I shift it just enough to make it feel like, Whoa, I did not expect that. Maybe sometimes that's music, musically driven, um, Mm -hmm. or maybe it's, physically driven, you know, um, and sometimes it's emotionally driven in terms of emotion. I am not thinking about any type of emotion, to be honest. 
I'm just thinking about being present in the in the movement and sometimes the physicality of the movement and and how I present the movement whether it's slow or fast or hard or soft um they create natural emotions you know because mm-hmm. I'm I'm present in what I'm feeling um so if that's like I'm sliding open in a slow deep whatever it is like that will make me feel something on the inside that then mm-hmm. appears you know on my face or whatever but I'm not actually thinking about like boohoo here or whippy here you know like i'm not thinking about any of those things necessarily yeah. I, but i try to i try to allow the organic uh energy in my body to flow i guess that sometimes comes off as like deep or even sensual sometimes i've had people say you know yeah i i it, it, i could see that people think that i feel a lot when i uh when i show my my art but um Half the time, I don't know what I'm doing, you know, I'm just like, oh, that must have been, oh, you know, but also like the, the struggle of trying to get the thing right. Like some of the things you can see, like oh, I'm fighting for it and then I get it, you know, like that, that's probably what people are seeing is like the struggle to the accomplishment and it's making people feel things. And hmm. yeah, everyone says something different. And that's, I think that's the goal is I, I like that people can feel something from it, you know? It's all that matters, really, is that people are yeah. feeling things, you know? Art art can – I don't have to say a single word in order to make people feel things, so I kind of see it as a superpower. But, um, yeah, yeah I, I don't really know what I'm thinking about other than the physicality of the movement and how I can uh, constantly um, one-up myself maybe. Uh, hmm. So, yeah, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but – yeah, no, absolutely. Um, as a whole, though, what you present uh, to like social media is, th- would you consider it to be like a combination of also like modern dance as well as like the very flowy kind of movements and the the emotional pull? Yeah, I think uh, so. My background in dance is definitely mm-hmm. uh, like what I took seriously in my high school was was Horton uh, Lester mm-hmm. Horton technique, and um, and and my teacher who was one of my uh, mentors throughout high school. He, um, he trained under the original Lester, he, uh, he trained under Lester Horton and, um, was one of the original Lester Horton dancers, which, uh, he went to high school with Alvin Ailey and Carmen DeLavalade and all these big people. Um, they're all from LA actually too, which is crazy. They had their, their theater was in on Melrose and, um, Hmm. like literally almost a hundred years ago. And, uh, They, my, my teacher, my mentor, my dance mentor, he, um, was in the first Alvin Ailey company. He was best friends with Alvin, you know, like he had, he just had this rich, uh, history. And, um, I, I learned a lot from him and I studied his tech. I studied the, te- the Lester Horton technique from him, uh, for mm-hmm. four years straight. And, um, it was really intense and not always the most fun, um, but that really solidified my foundation. Um, there was ballet too. I was taking ballet consistently and I was taking Luigi jazz um, as well. So I feel like, um, and then I have my, my natural, like what I started with hip hop. So I have all these different backgrounds that I really engaged in. And um, I, I like the Lester Horton technique so much that I, I want to incorporate it in a lot of what I do. So you will see, elements of modern in my in my movement but based off of the way that the the society is moving in terms of dance um people are considering my work contemporary because sometimes you can't tell what's happening it looks a little flowy it looks a little hard hitting it looks a little fast it looks a little slow it looks a little modern it looks a little ballet you know so when you can't tell what it is contemporary it is says contemporary (laughs) exactly Nice. I like it. I like it. So, so to shift gears here, I'm just curious, kind of what is the day in the life like for you? Um, you know, like work, work ethic wise and all the work that you're doing. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there's like auditions or rehearsals or, you know, pieces that you're doing, but if you could give us kind of, you know, a breakdown of maybe what, uh, a, a hypothetical day in the life is like for you. Well, I usually wake up relatively early, not relatively early. I wake up at a decent hour, but, um, I'm mm-hmm. sure other people get up way earlier than I do. I, I get up at around seven thirty eight 8 AM, you know? Um, and I challenge myself to, uh, chant, uh, you know, I engage in my Buddhist practice for about at least 40 to 45 minutes to an hour. 
Mm-hmm. And um, mainly because I feel like I, I really need the life force to be able to withstand the uncertainty of my career and life, you know, every day. And so um, I need a strong life force to be able to do that. And so I challenge myself to get a good, lengthy, um, abundant uh, chanting in. And so uh, that's definitely first and foremost, I start with that. Um, and if I have time, I'll do a little Buddhist study as well. Um, just, you know, a little pick me up to uh, make me feel more um, confident or courageous even, which can be interchangeable, but uh, courageous. I like courageous because it helps me face the things that are presenting themselves in front of me, you know? And so um, I depends on the day. Cause you know, because of the uncertainty of my career, I, there may be days where I have nothing going on and there may be days where I have too much going on, but um, I typically uh, will meet up with other dancers to collaborate. Uh, I have an amazing friend who lets us use her, her dance studio in her apartment complex. And so nice. for free too, because it's expensive to rent space here. Uh, so yeah, I like to meet up with, with different friends and, and different people to give them the opportunity to collaborate, to work on partner work, which is, you know, it's one thing to dance by yourself. It's a whole other story dancing with another person. And even though you may be training or have had training in it, if you're not actively engaging in that partner work, then it's very easy to, to forget how to do it. So it's fun getting, getting in the studio to work, to collab with other dancers because, um, it's like, Oh crap, how do I remember this? How do I remember that? So I, I try to challenge myself to do that pretty consistently, meet up and collaborate with other dancers. Um, I depends on if I have a job or not, but I, I have rehearsals a lot of the times, ideally during the day, the first half of the day, because dancing at night can be a pain in the butt and a little dangerous because it's, you know, when you get late, when it gets late, it, you get tired. So, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, dancing at night can be harder, but it does happen right now. I'm currently in rehearsals where they're all happening in the evening, 6 PM to 9 PM. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a challenge, but, um, I also teach pretty regularly. So, uh, I, I teach, usually during the days, morning, morning to, you know, 10 AM on certain days, 11 and 12 and, uh, on other days. So, um, I try to keep my teaching during the middle of the day, but, um, yeah, in the evening, I'm usually, if I don't have rehearsal, I, I definitely like to hang out with my friends and just engage with different people. Um, you know, the dance community is small, but it's large at the same time. So, and I've been around for a hot second. So I've, I've you know, I've been able to connect with uh, many people. So I try to constantly engage with, with people as well, um, within my mm-hmm. dance community, but also, um, I, I, I'm a leader, I'm a youth leader in the SGI. And so I, part of being a youth leader is supporting other, um, youth that practice this Buddhism. And so I'm often, uh, engaging with my fellow, you know, uh, Buddhist young men, uh, and, and just helping them with their practice. And I try to set up visits for, with my guys in the evenings as well. Um, actually lately it's been during the days on, on Wednesdays and Thursdays, we've been meeting up during the day because we all have that time off. So it's like, great, let's do it. You know? Um, but I have Buddhist meetings a lot in the evening and because of, uh, being a leader in the Buddhist organization, I meet up with my, my co-leaders to, uh, figure out how we can best support, you know, the, the people that in, in our area, you know, that practice Buddhism, mm-hmm. how can, what can we do this week to ensure that they're getting the most out of their practice and that they can win in their lives. And so, I, I end up in those meetings, you know, quite often, uh, in the evenings usually. Uh, but yeah. And then of course I, I end my day with another, another little bit of chanting, maybe not an hour long, but, um, I won't say how short, but, uh, I, I do. end <laughs> I end my day with, with, you know, my, my Buddhist practice as well, just to kind of reflect on what I've been able to accomplish or maybe didn't accomplish. And again, redetermine, um, what it is that I want in my life and in my career. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, on, on average, that's pretty, pretty much how it goes here and there. I'll go out for drinks with friends. Uh, I have a friend who loves to invite me to, uh, a Tex-Mex bar where they have, huge, uh, margar- frozen margaritas and I'm a sucker nice. for a frozen, a frozen anything, you know? So, um, there, I, I will go out here and there. I'm not typically one to, to go out and get crazy though, but, um, 
yeah, I, I do like to, again, engage with my, my friends and family. I also hang out with my, my brother a lot. Um, he lives, my, my mom and my brother and sister live like a mile away from me. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I find myself whenever I have a free moment here and there, because they're so close, I just come over and I hang out and sometimes eat some good food, you know, uh, wash, yeah. do some laundry, but, uh, but yeah, I try to, I try to spend time with my family as well. So there's a lot, there's a lot going on. Every day is different. It's never consistent, you know, but, um, yeah, I try to, I try to pack it in again, laziness. I, I, my life stems from laziness. And so I really challenge myself to, to go the extra mile and do a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Um, especially because my, I have, you know, my spiritual mentor, he, he literally has been showing us his whole life how to do it. And, I can't really call myself a disciple if I'm not doing that, you know? So yeah, I really just got to challenge myself to, again, keep one upping myself every day. Incredible. Well said. Thank you so much. Um, I meant to ask this too, cause this was like, I don't know, like an hour ago when we started this, but you shared about your brother and going to the hospital. Is he okay and survived and everything is good with him now? Uh, I just wanted to follow up. Yeah, that's that's my younger brother actually, but uh yeah, mm -hmm. who went who was in the hospital. He uh was diagnosed with cancer at 13 and um wow. he is the youngest of well, if you include my older brother and I, there's eight siblings um and right. he's the youngest or he's mm -hmm. one of the twins, there's two of them. He's they're twins and he uh, they're the youngest ones, but uh yeah, he was 13 uh and he got, had a tumor on his knee, I believe. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, he was in chemo for about eight months or so. And, mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until, uh, yeah, I remember chanting for him, uh, to get out of the hospital. I was like, all right, it's, it's like the end of September and I want him to be out of the hospital by January 1st, mm -hmm. new year's day. He's done with cancer, you know? And, uh, uh chanting for him every every day wake up and chant an hour and make sure that i felt good about what i was chanting for especially for him and um yeah it was like it came to christmas it came to new year's eve and uh so far he hadn't hit me up about like going into the hospital or anything so i'm like huh interesting i wonder if my prayer is working is it actually working like is he not gonna go into the hospital anymore like what's going on mm. and uh new year's eve a few hours later after thinking that <laughs> he uh he texts me and he's like hey i'm going into the hospital today mm. and i was like oh okay are you going in for chemo he's like no i'm sick with a fever so i have to go in because of that um so what he wasn't going in for chemo he was sick for a fever and when you're sick with cancer you um, if you have a fever, they, you know, it's just safer to go in and be monitored by the doctors. And right. so, uh, I went, I went with him and I stayed the night with him and, um, the fever ended up lasting like 10 days. And I remember, oh, wow. uh, I remember, yeah, I remember chanting like, or I remember thinking like, what the heck? Like it's been 10 days past my goal. Even like I, I set a goal for th four months ago. Like he needs to be out of here by January 1st. What the heck? It's like January 8th at this point. Yeah. And, uh, the next, then after like having those thoughts, like I got woken up the next morning at like six in the morning, um, by the nurses saying that they checked my brother's levels and, um, his levels were too low, whatever that meant mm -hmm. that they needed to start chemo. Which means if they start chemo, that's another seven days that we'd be in the hospital. And we had already been in there for 10 days. And so right. I was very angry because um, that meant that we would be living in that hospital for half a month. And right. and also I was angry because because it's like way past my goal date. And I'm like, right. no. Right. So I, I remember, I remember uh, storming out of the room and I just went straight to like their study room. And it was super early though. I don't know why I stormed out that early, but uh, I just got up and I went straight to the room and I started chanting. I started chanting like for the first time because this, this was about like five months into my practice. I received mm -hmm. my Gohanzen and became a member in August and now it's January, you know? And so this is the first time that I'm chanting where like, you know what? The second I get back to his room, everything's going to be changed. We're not, we're getting out of here. We are leaving the hospital. He's cancer free. It's done. We're done. I'm deciding right now. And it was the first time that I chanted in that way. It was the first time that I like 
had no doubt about it. Like, this is what's going to happen. I'm decided, you know, and it's after the hour of chanting like that, I walked to his room or I'm walking back through the hallway and the, do- the nurses are like, oh, there you are. We've been looking for you for the past 10 minutes. Um, they, they were trying to tell me that they checked his levels while I was out there chanting and somehow all his levels went back to normal and that he wasn't going to actually have to stay for chemo that he was going to get released that day. And, um, and they let me know that next week he, he was scheduled to go in for chemo, but if all goes well, then it would be his last. And, and then we went in, we went in that next week and they kicked him out after a day and a half because of how well he was doing. He was eating like a pig. He was talking. He was so lively. They needed to use that space for someone who actually needed it. So they kicked him out and, you know, he was cancer free for a while after that, actually. Um, he did end up growing another tumor. Um, Mm -hmm. and he didn't have to go, go through chemo for that. They were able to take it out. He did get another tumor somewhere else. So he went in for chemo for that. And then he had his, his last, um, instance when he was like 18, just about to turn 18, um, where he got another, uh, tumor, and so um, now, over the past four years, he's been cancer free. Uh, but wow. yeah, it was it was definitely a battle. Um, I think after that first um, breakthrough, though, after the first time, um, he when it came back around again, he wasn't as scared anymore. He wasn't he wasn't mm-hmm. like he. I think he knew that he could overcome it, um, and. And what's cool too is that every time he would get sick, like he requested me to be there with him, type of thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, even <laughs> one of my, he like helped me fulfill one of my childhood dreams of going to Disney World. <laughs> um, he, he did his Make a Wish. Actually, he wasn't even trying. He wasn't even trying to go to Disney World for his Make a Wish. He like wanted a game mm-hmm. system, which he got. Like they gave him like four gift cards to be able to buy this game system, but. Wow. Uh, after he was like finished with chemo and finished with cancer several months later, they contacted him saying like, Hey, we're giving you four free tickets to go to Disney world for, for, you know, 10 days or something like that. Um, and you can take anyone you want with you. And you know, my dad and his twin brother were obviously going to go, but I thought that he would give the other ticket to my dad's wife or something, you know, Mm -hmm. but he requested that I go, you know? And so, uh, I was just like, Oh my God, really? Like I never thought that I'd ever get to go. And we got to go for free. It was actually pretty bad yeah. because I can never go to a theme park ever again. Every ride we went on, we were put in the first, you know, first, like yeah. we didn't have to wait for a single thing. We were able to do the entire park in like half a day, twice. Wow. You know, we could do the whole park wow. twice in half a day and then go to another park the next day or go to the other park the next half of the day and like do it twice. You know, like literally we went mm-hmm. everything you could do in, in Orlando, Florida. We did it in the time span that we did it with like so much extra time, you know, and I got to really like bond with my little brothers, um, because they live with my dad. They, they, I don't live with them. I didn't, um, always see them growing up, but, um, right. It was a really awesome opportunity. And of course, you know, I got to fulfill that childhood dream of like going to Disney world, you know, I never thought that that would ever happen. So it was, it was a really amazing experience. That's awesome. I love that. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. What an incredible story. And, it, and on top of that, right, it really showed you, I'm sure, the the power of your own practice, right, to be able to, like, overcome something for someone else. Yeah, not just yourself. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It showed me the power of my life, that right. I can actually yeah. achieve these things with, through this practice, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. I love that. Um, okay. I only have a few more questions here that I <laughs> will let you go. Um, maybe quickly kind of, uh, what's one thing or a couple of things that you've learned about yourself while being a choreographer and a dancer and, you know, kind of helping others through the, the form of dance. I've realized that <laughs> I have high expectations. <laughs> um, I, I can be a little hard or harsh on people. Um, I did, I did meet up with someone to collab and she did share like, um, that it's been like two years since she's done any kind of partner work. You know, I realized during, during our collab session that I was like, like being like stern and strict and, and whatnot. Um, and, and I did share the reason why I, I want to be this way. You know, I want to make sure that we're, we're both putting out good quality work and of course it's social media too. So, you know, 
if we're if we're dancers and we and uh, and we're friends with other professionals, they will see when we mess up. You know, they will see all the little hiccups and whatnot. So, you know, I wanted to. I wanted us to. I wanted it to be clear that we're putting out something of of good quality, um, and obviously to show our skills and what we can do. I, I realized, like, crap, am I going overboard here? And so I like I mentioned to her, I was like, I'm sorry if I'm going a little overboard. She's like, No, actually, this is perfect. I need, I need this strictness because I feel like I'm so like uh, disconnected from from this because I haven't done it in so long that I need that little push in order to get it right. I need you to tell me if you know, if you see these things, tell me so that I can do it, you know, um, because at the end of the day, we both want to put out good quality stuff. Um, but I, that is something. And it just means that I, and I, I did share this with her. It's, it's because I believe in their potential. Um, and so I want to be someone that helps pull out that potential. I wouldn't be working with someone if I didn't think that they could that they could do it, you know? Yeah, I feel like this is something that I've been able to learn and, and also utilize is like being able to be the person to pull out people's potential even through movement. Help them find something um, authentic in themselves, but also an elevated version of what of who they thought they were, you know, through dance. Amazing. Do you find yourself uh, conflicted or kind of trying to be a perfectionist because I know a lot of artists go through that myself included of kind of really striving for something but then if it doesn't like oh it just kind of pisses you off or frustrates you if you don't get it to quote unquote perfect the way you see it yeah I used to be that way um okay. however and you know naturally because I'm, I'm a Virgo you know Virgo Libra cusp but uh I'm a Virgo and so you know detail is is definitely uh Detail is is a big thing. I, I bring it back to my Buddhist practice. I really feel like because of my Buddhist practice, I I'm very confident with what I put out that mm. it that what I'm putting out is what it's meant to be. So if mm. I mess up, if it looks different, if it was the wrong this or that, I, I and I teach this in my class. It's like how do we go with that? How do we use all the hiccups, all the mess ups and create something out of it rather than feeling like, oh, that was wrong. And you stop the energy and you go back and you do it again. Like, no, everything has value. Everything has meaning and purpose. And the more we hone in on that and allow ourselves to be present in our dancing, the more that the the natural qualities of who we are can shine through our movement. Yeah. Now I'm more about like, as long as we're present and as long as we're committed, that's that's really all that matters because everything that you're going to present right now is what exact is what exactly what the world needs to see you know so yeah i i tr i mean when i'm when i'm choreographing and setting work on on a company or on a on people you know i definitely say like okay challenge doing this challenging that however when it doesn't happen it's not like ah, you know it's like all right that's that's what it needed to be you know I'm, and i feel very confident and assured about it especially when i when I chant about my work, that it's going to impact people. I, I chant mm. that my work positively impacts the entire globe. So mm. I feel like because of, because I chant that and because I have the faith, you know, back behind it, um, backing it up, I really believe that I can be confident when, with what I'm putting out because I have my, my Daimoku behind it. Mm. Amazing. Uh, so moving right along, <laughs> uh, who has been like your biggest supporter or fan that's really helped you kind of keep going through, you know, this whole process, uh, and kind of, you know, been there to go through the ups and downs with you along yeah. the way. I'm very independent <laughs> and I feel like I, I try to do things on my own a lot. Um, mm -hmm. and I try to, uh, uh, give myself and others the benefit of the doubt. And I, I do notice like engaging with my fellow dancers, you know, talking about career wise and just the dance world, like engaging with my, my friends in the dance world, um, just engaging with them. It doesn't even have to necessarily be about talking about uh, what didn't go well or whatever it is. Just engaging with them helps me feel better. Um, also, um, this idea of proving to them that there is no need to give up. This is something that I've been incorporating to my daily life really um, over the past like five ish years now. And um, I'm realizing uh, that that's something 
that keeps me motivated to want to push forward still um, mm -hmm. is like, all right, people, I need to show people, I need to show others that I, you know, that this isn't the end, you know, that there is still something that can come out of this. And um, mm. that's been a really big motivator for me, to be honest. So like having people to support is what has been a, a big motivator because it gives me the drive to, to want to show proof in my life and um, mm. so that they can see it and, and, and be able to believe it in themselves as well, you know? Um, but of course, engaging with my friends is, is a great way to do that. And you know, to be honest, my Buddhist community, anytime that I'm, mm. I feel like I'm struggling with something, I'm able to have dialogue with people who are consistently studying the Buddhist philosophy and, and they're able to help me see different perspectives of things. And just going to a Buddhist meeting and hearing someone share their experience, light bulbs start to go off in my head, whether I spoke to them directly or not, you know? And so, yeah. um, yeah, I feel like my Buddhist community has really been a big, huge support uh, to to staying positive and staying, you know, reassured on on the course that I'm meant to to be on. You know, so amazing. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so, looking to the future, what are maybe some goals that you have for like the next year, three to five years, or even ten years from now, which seems daunting? Yeah. Um, ideally, I. Uh, can create a career in movement direction, becoming a movement director, uh, which it's, it's moving there. And I have done a little bits here and there, but, um, mm -hmm. I, I can really establish myself in that way. And I can work with many different, I can work in the dance world in many different facets from, uh, working with actors to creating a flow and a scene, whether it's dance related or not, maybe it's just like the way background moves in the, in, in, at a mall, you know, like maybe I'm shooting something and it's at a mall and I want people going down the escalators. I want people walking here and then you pass through here and then it, you reveal the main actors and they start walking towards, you know, things like that. That's also movement direction. Um, working mm. with Spider-Man on how to cool. do the, you know, like that's movement direction, or it could even be like choreographing a musical or, you know, a scene that has, a big dance number or a duet or whatever it is like it can incorporate so many different uh, things as a dancer choreographer movement direction. Mm -hmm. um, so that is ideally the, the long-term goal. That's where I want to be in the next like three years, even if I can. Um, and yeah, I, I want to be able to have a solid uh, financial uh, uh mm. Uh, what, what, uh, f solid financial stability, you know, I want that, <laughs> um, which is hard, but, um, again, I want to prove to people that it is possible because it is possible. I know people that are doing it. Um, yeah. I just can't separate myself from them. I can't think like, oh, that's because they're them and I'm me that I can't do it. Right. Um, if they can do it, right. I should be able to, too. I'm going to use them as like inspiration for, or fuel for inspiration, you know? Yeah. I, 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 and I also want to be continue. I want to continue dancing and performing. Um, I want to continue. I've been working commercially. I've seen just within the past couple of years from the jobs that I've done on TV. Um, there are older dancers that are still working. And it's interesting because there, you know, there's a lot of people think that, Oh, I'm, I get to a certain age and there's no way for me, but if you stick it out, you're going to be one of the only older dancers that are getting hired on everything because they always, now they're like TV, the TV world or TV film world is really trying hard to be inclusive. And that includes age as well. So you're seeing exactly. a lot of different types of people getting hired for things. And, and I know that if they're doing it, then why should I leave anytime soon? You know, so I'm, I'm more motivated to keep that up as well. And, um, yeah, I want to do, I want to do commercials too, you know, not just dance, but I want to, I don't have any necessary like desire to be a lead actor in anything by any means. I mean, if it comes along, it comes along, but um, I do want to book commercials and I do, uh, I do like being in that world and that environment and, you know, it does pay well too, <laughs> to say the least commercials are where it's at right now, you know? So uh, yeah, I, I, that's definitely something I want to be able to accomplish uh, over the next like year two years, three years, and then some, um, but then soon choreographing for commercials too, you know? Mm. So very cool. Fantastic. Uh, this is a fun question I ask everyone, which is what would you say to your future self, uh, 15 years from now? So almost like a message in a bottle to yourself 
to kind of, yeah, look at 15 years from now and kind of retrospect. Yeah. If I got the chance to experience my, my older self, my 15 year older self, uh, I would probably tell him to, uh, not forget who you are (laughs) and Mm -hmm. to, uh, yeah, keep honing in on, on being authentic because, uh, I feel like that's the more I can, or what I'm realizing, the more I'm, I'm feeding into my own authenticity, the more I'm able to actually connect to other people, you know? Um, and, and yeah, I feel like if I'm creating from a place of authenticity, uh, what I'm creating feels real and people can relate to it, even though it's abstract. So yeah, to, to not forget who you are. Amazing. I totally agree. Do not forget who you are because, yeah, there's only one you. Um, what is one phrase yeah. or motto that you live <laughs> – what is uh, a motto or phrase that you live by if you have one? Oh, uh, I could say this only because it's one thing that I've been saying since I was in high school, mainly mm-hmm. because my dance mentor would always say it. Mm-hmm. It's K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid. Yes. <laughs> I like it. I yeah. like it. And if not that one, maybe, maybe, uh, and if, if not that one, uh, 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 I, another one that my dance mentor would say was, uh, never try, just do, or he would say, try as another word for failure. Just do. Mm. So it's interesting. Yeah. It's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, awesome. Well, that does wrap it up. Uh, I want to know for everyone that's watching and listening, uh, where can they follow you on social media and, or do you have a website? And if they want to take one of your classes as well, where can they, uh, join you? Sure. Yay. Yeah. Um, I do not have a website. I just mainly focus on social media and uh, the only social media I have is Instagram. So you can find me at, uh, JM 22 and MRK. And, uh, I teach classes. If you're interested in up for a healthy challenge, I teach classes at Genesis, the studio, uh, in Eagle rock, Glassell park area, Tuesday mornings, 11, 15 AM, uh, to 1 PM. And I also teach class on Saturday mornings at 10 AM at the space LA, which is, uh, kind of close to Chinatown, uh, the brewery, um, artist lofts area, but, uh, yeah, feel free to come and dance with me and have a good time. Fantastic. Thank you so much, JM. This was awesome. I know that we uh, battled through technical difficulties and made this happen. So I really appreciate your time and yeah. uh, sharing all your stories thank and everything. You. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for watching and listening to this week's episode of the Creative Lotus Podcast. And a huge thank you to JM Rodriguez for all of his time and amazing stories. This week's Buddhist quote of the week is... Do not despair or grow impatient over transient phenomena. Life is long. Even if you have problems, even if you have done things you regret or have made mistakes, your whole future still lies ahead of you by Daisaku Ikeda. Thanks again for watching. Go ahead and give us a big five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you're watching here on YouTube, please give us that big thumbs up. It really does help out the channel. And if you want to check out another full episode, check out this one right here. And until then, we'll see you there. Have a wonderful day and stay safe. Bye-bye. What is up, Creative Lotus family? Thank you so much for supporting the Creative Lotus podcast. Go ahead and follow us on social media. On Facebook, we're at the Creative Lotus podcast. Here on YouTube, maybe you're watching, we're at the Creative Lotus podcast as well. And on Instagram, we're at the Creative Lotus pod. And my personal handle is at Alan Zaki. We say thank you once again. Go ahead and subscribe, listen, write a review. And until the next episode, we'll see you there. Have a wonderful day and stay safe. Bye-bye.